Space has always scared me. There could be life out there, but as far as we know, we are all there is. What we do know is that there is activity out there, as depicted in the series of images from 1874, that show the movement of Venus. Science fiction movies, however, allow us to explore the impossible. And who's to say extraterrestrial life forms couldn't be gorillas and diver helmets? Many a filmmaker has attempted to explore the possibilities in creative ways. Others, however, make films destined for obscurity. And where do these films go? Well, they either get lost to time, becoming lost media, or they live on through less than prestigious positions. The Walmart Bargain Bin It's my favorite time of the year yet again. The leaves are turning red, and I'm ready to binge a bunch of scary horror films. This year will be a little different, however, as I decided to return to a format I kickstarted the current tenure of my channel on, reviewing one of these 50 movie box sets. I covered Mill Creek's horror box set last summer, so throughout the rest of October I'll be taking a look at their science fiction themed box set in the hopes of finding some hidden gems. The box art shows Gamera, so I already know there's going to be a couple movies in here I will like. But with a couple exceptions I've seen before on places like Mystery Science Theater 3000, most of these films will be a completely fresh watch. These won't be extremely in-depth reviews of all these films, I don't want this thing to be five hours long, but it will be enough to let you know what I think about these movies, and let me tell you, a lot of these are stinkers. Now this box set has a little bit of history. It was initially released by a company called Treeline in 2004, but the two copies I have here are Mill Creek reissues from 2005 and 2009 respectively. And there are some slight differences between the movie selections of the Mill Creek and Treeline releases. Also just gonna say up front that I will not dedicate more than one minute to a movie if it doesn't have horror slash sci-fi elements. In the horror themed box set, rather confusingly, Mill Creek had all these crime drama films in there, and I feel like I wasted my time talking about them. The equivalent to those on this box set are jungle adventure movies, so I will be giving brief reviews to those before I move on. I'm also gonna say up front that a lot of these movies are gonna look like dog shit. Mill Creek, or Treeline, or whoever sourced some of these transfers, took them from the ugliest VHS rips they could find, and it really shows. If there's a Blu-ray available and I own it, I'll use it. But with that said, let's get right into it. Welcome to the Spookathon. Not off to a great start. The incredible petrified world is the product of one Jerry Warren. It was originally shot in 1957, but withheld from release until 1959, when it was shown in a double feature with teenage zombies. Honestly, they should have kept it shelved. This is the sea. Why thank you, I didn't know what that was. After a boring science presentation about the creatures of the deep sea, the film proper begins. The petrified world in question is the bottom of the sea, which is explored by an expedition team. You'd think the headlining star John Carradine would join the expedition, but nah, he sticks around on the boat and sees them off. He loses contact with the team, and they set out to explore an underwater cavern, where they encounter a crazy bearded man, I've been here 14 years, an active volcano, and a single lizard. Nothing to really write home about. There's nothing friendly between two females. There never was and there never will be. The underwater scenes look like ass. The whole movie does, actually, which is more of a symptom of this DVD set using an uncleaned transfer. The principal cast's acting is pretty stilted. So many scenes consist of them standing or sitting, talking about what they're going to do next and then acting upon it five billion years later. There's some catty dialogue between the ladies, which is the closest this film gets to interpersonal drama. Craig said this. Craig said that. The film switches between what this group is doing and what John Carradine is doing to rescue them. I see two men in the water. 
Wow, so apparently they didn't even fall deep enough to not be visible from the surface. This whole adventure could have been circumvented if the people on the boat looked a little harder the first time. This movie is barely over an hour and it still feels like it goes on forever. The back and forth between plot A and plot B makes the pacing really tedious. And the voyage these characters go on lacks any sort of impressive, fantastical event. This is the kind of movie that would have worked better with a bigger budget. Not a great start to the video. The next movie of this box set, Queen of the Amazons, has nothing to do with the stereotypical depiction of the all-female Amazons. It's actually about people who just live in the Amazon. Not sure why it's in this science fiction box set either. It's an adventure film. It follows a woman named Jean trying to find her missing husband, Greg. It turns out he has been captured by a tribe. I've never been a fan of these types of jungle movies because more often than not, half the runtime is walking through the jungle, encountering stock footage of animals. I wish I was doing this list in alphabetical order because I hate to veto a movie this early, but quite frankly, I don't care enough to give this movie, this unrelated to the genre of the video, my time. There's some espionage, hokey dialogue, the stock footage is more interesting than the movie itself. I tried paying attention, but it's like, fuck man, where are the aliens? The ALMAOs, the xenomorphs. Next movie. Moon of the Wolf, now this is more like it. It's more horror than science fiction, not sure why it wasn't in the horror box set, but it has stronger ties to the genre than a jungle adventure film from the 40s. Not only that, but it's a movie in color, and it's from the 70s. Seeing any movie made past the 60s is something worth celebrating, considering I don't get a lot of those in these box sets. Following the discovery of a dead body, it's determined the cause of death wasn't from some wild animal, but... You've got a murder, Sheriff. Sure enough. It's a werewolf. The werewolf's last name is Rodanth. Rodanth? That caught me off guard. The T, H, and E at the end are silent. The murder mystery element doesn't really work because it's pretty obvious who the werewolf is. But I thought this one was okay. It's a TV movie, so I don't have the same expectations for something that wasn't released in theaters. So I expect something on a smaller scale. The camera's gonna be locked down for most of the runtime, nothing crazy, just some close-ups, POVs, and slow trucking shots. Maybe a couple snap zooms too. I enjoy the Louisiana Bayou setting, it adds flavor to this otherwise standard horror-themed murder mystery plot. It's driven by dialogue and performances, and both are pretty decent for the most part. David Jansen has a dogged tiredness as the sheriff that brings believability to the role. If there is a person that can tear iron bars out of a brick wall. And that's the best way to describe Moon of the Wolf. It's a sleepy movie you put on in the background. The mystery falls flat, and it's not particularly scary or suspenseful, but it comes out perfectly decent thanks to its cast. And it gets pretty fun in the last 20 minutes when the werewolf finally appears. It's easily the best movie so far. <laughs> With a title like She Gods of Shark Reef, you'd expect something fun, like say, Shark Girls, but nah, it's just a bunch of ladies on an island. Again, it's not really a sci-fi movie. It's about as much of a sci-fi movie as Swamp Women is a horror film. I swear, did Mill Creek only pick these movies for the titles? And speaking of Swamp Women, it's another early effort from future prolific B-movie director Roger Corman. And yeah, it's not one of his better movies, if you could believe it. <coughs> Two men get shipwrecked near an island populated by women. The two men are brothers, and one of them is a criminal. They encounter murky stock footage of sharks. The colors in general are just really washed out and ugly. There are endless dancing and singing scenes, a staple of bad B-movies. It is a time the gods are angry. We have had great winds for a month. This lady switches between fractured, broken English and proper sentences in every scene. That place taboo. Shark god angry long time now. But yeah, this movie is sluggishly paced, and I was utterly bored with it. Next movie. The Amazing Transparent Man. What's so amazing about him? All I've gotta do is this. Boom. There's your transparent man. No need to make a movie about it. No, what's actually amazing about this movie is how it's only 57 minutes. I imagine you've seen enough for one day, hmm? Opening with a prison escape scene and evading detection from a very gullible police officer. 
drunk driving. Well, there's no need to bother him. Convict Joey Faust is turned invisible by a mad scientist, and he is used to commit crimes against his will. The invisibility is an ego boost at first, but it starts wearing off mid-mission, and it even has nuclear consequences. The Faustian reference doesn't really work since the main character is given a special power against his own will, so right out of the gate the parallel isn't the most comparable. The film descends into unintentional comedy when Faust becomes invisible, and the other actors have to mime his interactions with them. It's like a poor man's invisible man. Here we go gathering nuts and may on a cold and frosty morning. Whoops. The amazing transparent man is hokey as shit, but the acting is decent, the short runtime gives it a breezy pacing, and it's got a number of funny moments. It's such a simple premise, and the film delivers. This man does indeed become transparent. The title isn't a tease. It even ends with the mad scientist addressing you, yes, you, directly. What would you do? A bit telling of the set's quality so far that this is the second best film so far. But that can quickly change. Next movie. Bada bing bada boom, hey look at that, it's our next movie, The Atomic Brain. It was shot in 1958 as Monstrosity, but it was shelved until 1963. Dr. Frank, a little too on the nose with the name there, is experimenting on transplanting human and animal brains. His experiments are funded by an aging woman who plans on having her brain put in the body of a younger woman, and she invites three of them to her spooky mansion. Okay, that's kind of a creepy science fiction premise. I can see why it's on this box set. I'm a doctor, I'll take care of her. Unfortunately, this is a high-concept B-movie, where every other element doesn't work. No one will be seated during the thrilling walking down the stairs scene. Oh, this is really testing my patience. <laughs> oh, God, 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 God. There's a dog man who came about as a result of one of Dr. Frank's experiments. He also transplants the brain of a cat into a girl, and if this is what real life cat girls would be like, I don't know if I want them anymore. Anita, listen to me. It's... Hell, they squandered the opportunity for a dog man versus cat girl fight scene. Eventually, the brain of the old lady gets put in the cat to stop her evil scheme, but that doesn't stop her from being evil. Yeah, this movie sucks. Next one. Man, there's a lot of woman-themed movies on this set. Sex appeal sells, I guess. But this movie definitely wasn't made to be hot. A beauty company's sales are declining, and Janice Starling, the aging CEO whose face is used in advertising, is blamed. In the hopes of rejuvenating her looks, a biologist gives her an experimental jelly extracted from wasps to make her young. She's got less makeup making her look older, I guess. There's not much of a change. The biologist demonstrates this by turning a guinea pig into a mouse. Pretty sure that's not how biology works. It's not possible. It's like how Konga thinks chimps are just younger versions of guys in gorilla suits. The soundtrack throughout is just really unfitting. There's dramatic horror music playing when nothing is happening. And big band jazz music during the horror scenes. It's like they got him switched around. Mary! Mary! The Wasp Woman herself is a unique monster, at least. Too bad she's in such a shit movie. Oh, no! Oh, God. Whoa. Oh, God. A bunch of quacks we're Gotta squish that cat! Land. There's not a lot of attempted suspense or tension until the last act when Starling starts turning into the Wasp Woman and offing people. Until then, all she really gets is a headache. It contributes to a sluggish pacing. While the scenes with the Wasp Woman are fun, they don't make up for the rest of it. While it may be boring in execution, it does make for an interesting entry in this collection. If you're gonna see this one, skip to the last 10 minutes.
Like the Fly, this movie actually got a remake. Not sure if I want to cover this one. I'm in love, I'm in love with an insect woman. She's been strangled. The spider. Keeping with the theme of bug-faced killers, Horrors of Spider Island features a man with a spider face. I hate to imagine the children he'd have with Wasp Woman. So here's the gist of it. Horrors of Spider Island is a dubbed German film. All right, you can work with us, as long as you don't have any affairs. It's about a bunch of girls and one guy who crash in the middle of the ocean on the way to a gig in Singapore. The good news is that they found an island. The bad news is that we're subjected to the girls bickering for half an hour. Also, the island is full of spiders and getting bitten by one turns you into a spider person. It's kind of misogynistic, too. Smile, will you? When they get stranded on the island, a bunch of the women act like spoiled children, and the guy, Gary as he's named, has to come in and break them up like he's their dad or something. Stop that fighting. Okay, girls, that's enough. Let's go and have a look around. Come on, come on, come on. The way this film writes women is terrible. The boys will be surprised when they see how we dressed ourselves up in our island costumes. The way it writes, everything is terrible, actually. A hammer with a long handle. It must be for the purpose of excavating some sort of metal. Most probably, uranium. The makeup on Spider Gary is pretty freaky, surprisingly. They didn't go all the way with it, only having it cover his hands and face, but it's the only good thing about the film. The transformation is instant, by the way. No long build up to them turning into spiders, just poof, instant Spider-Man. Yeah, this flick is just an excuse to parade around a bunch of women with the loose justification of a monster movie. Most of the final act is a party scene where the girls vie for the attention of two guys who happen upon the island. It's sleazy, it's boring. There's a high-pitched whirring that plays throughout the entire film due to it being a crappy VHS rip. What a strange silence. It's not worth your time. Unless you like your hot lady movies with off-putting mutated Spider-Men to kill whatever libido you've got. <laughs> Voyage to a Prehistoric Planet is a Roger Corman-produced re-edit of a Soviet movie named Planet of Storms. It's kind of amazing to me that we were still importing movies from the USSR during the most heated period of the Cold War. They even added fake names to the credits to hide the fact that this is a Russian film. Scenes with English-speaking actor Basil Rathbone were added to trick the viewer even further, but the rest of it is very clearly dubbed. Seems so unreal. Also, they forgot to leave out this shot of the rocket with Cyrillic on the side. The year 2020. There is no pandemic in this universe, but great strides have been taken in space travel. The prehistoric planet in the title is Venus. This is truly a prehistoric planet. Hey, he said it. The film follows a group of cosmonauts as they fend off the planet's many hazards, including hopping dinosaurs, pteranodons, and giant plants. Somewhat reminiscent of the angry red planet, but this one's got a robot. His name is Robot John. I love the production design of this film. The dinosaurs are goofy looking, the cosmonauts are riding around in a hover vehicle, and I don't know if it's just the shitty transfer, but I think they did a good job dressing up this Russian landscape as convincingly alien. Some really great miniatures, too. It really earns its place in this box set. I also enjoy the look of the robot, it's nice and retro. Unfortunately, that's where my praise ends. They want us for lunch. I'll try for a blood sample if I don't go. The characters are almost always cracking jokes about their predicament, like they saw a funny animal at the zoo and didn't just barely escape from certain doom. Can you imagine that? He's bashful. It deflates the tension and keeps the film's tone dull. This lack of tension carries over even into the most dangerous scenarios, like when the robot is carrying two cosmonauts over a river of lava and is forced to throw one of them off. There's so much time spent talking and less spent doing. The pacing is rather plodding, 
I know it's an older film and probably didn't have the budget for anything more than what's shown, but it really needed more dinosaur scenes. You can't just introduce something like that early on and underutilize it. The film's climax is also quite unclimactic. We must stay. We must stay. It involves this beehive hairdo lady almost taking off and landing on Venus, and the drama that ensues is short-lived. We quickly learn she didn't even take off and it's like, wow, thanks for wasting our time. I'm sure if she actually did land on the planet, they'd have to fake some set piece with her and the other actors because she's clearly from the reshot footage. The ending doesn't make any sense either. There's apparently humanoid creatures on the planet and they heard them throughout the film. Whatever. Yeah, this movie's got problems and it's writing and pacing, but I enjoyed this a little more than the other movies on the set. It's got fun production values. One of the better movies so far. With our next film, we're kicking it up a notch. We're not just going to any prehistoric planet. No, this is a voyage to a planet of prehistoric women. Ooh. And... Hey. Hey, wait a minute. This is just the same movie. Yeah, in a profoundly cheap move, Roger Corman once again used footage from Planet of Storms to tell what's essentially the same story. Can you imagine that? He's bashful. This time through a framing device as a narrator tells the story. Wait a minute, I'm getting ahead of myself. Let me tell you the whole story. There's also new footage that shows the race of humans living on Venus. It's women in bikinis, of course but they functionally serve the same purpose as the ominous ghostly noises heard throughout the last movie. Very economical of you, Mr. Corman. They also forgot to remove this shot of a spaceship with Cyrillic on the side in this movie, too. You are looking at the actual models of spacecraft now being developed by agencies of the United States government. Yeah, sure. So yeah, it's got all the same issues as the other movie, but it presents a choice. You can either watch a version that's slightly more faithful to the original Planet of Storms, or you could watch a version where hot babes interrupt the narrative every once in a while. Pick your poison. Alright, on to the next movie. I, uh, I, I appear to have misplaced it. And what's that sound? Wow, thanks for finding it, Gamera. You're the best. <laughs> Love that guy. And what a sight for sore eyes, a Gamera movie. Initially conceived by Japanese studio Daiei as a rival to Toho's Godzilla, Gamera would carve out his own identity as a friend to all children, a move that, ironically, forced Godzilla to play copycat when his films shifted to being more kid-friendly. The first two Gamera movies, however, were more like the first two Godzilla movies, being more straight-laced monster affairs, minus the whole bit about fear of nuclear power or any of that fun subtext. The first Gamera movie featured in this box set is the American cut of the first movie, Gamera the Invincible. Note to the two M's in the title. The copy included here is a cropped pan and scan, but I'll be using the widescreen version. Like the first Godzilla movie, this cut includes extra scenes with English-speaking actors, though it should be noted that the original Japanese version had scenes with English-speaking actors too. No, sir. It must be coated with anti-electric wave paint, sir. Cut, cut, okay. let's do that again. Which can get confusing when talking about this movie with other people. What's going on around here? I don't know, sir. Looks like a huge turtle made its appearance. The reshot scenes stick out like a sore thumb. Baby, it's cold outside. It's right, gorgeous. At least King of the Monsters made an effort to integrate the Raymond Burr footage. Steve! Steve Martin! Are you badly hurt? The American scenes in this film feel isolated from the rest of the movie. A giant turtle! I do enjoy the scene where political pundits discuss Gamera's existence. Their acting is just so goofy. I demand an apology. I've devoted my life to science, gentlemen. So here is the plot. During the cold open, an altercation between Soviet and American forces in the Arctic ends in a nuclear explosion that frees Gamera, a giant turtle, from the ice. 
from there, Gamera travels across the world before settling in Japan. He saves a little boy, named Toshio in this dub and the original cut, and infamously renamed Kenny in the Sandy Frank dub. Those kids at school, they tease you, Kenny because they never tasted hell. The rest of the film consists of Gamera's rampage through Japan as the government, with the help of Colonel Sanders, develops new strategies to stop him. Toshio, or Kenny, has clear mental hang-ups given his obsession with turtles. It's clear that this kid is supposed to be a little odd. What I don't understand is why this element was even included in the movie at all, because it paints Gamera very strangely. The film can't decide whether he's a benevolent creature who cares about kids or a vengeful monster who willingly destroys cities and kills thousands. It's clearly the former in later movies, so if anything, that should have been the direction from the very beginning instead of the this more Godzilla-like behavior. I wouldn't mind this being in the movie if it had a proper resolution. As is, Toshio just fumbles around in the narrative. It feels like two different movies are happening here. That said, he does well in setting himself apart with his own set of abilities. There's a great moment when the military flips him on his back, cause what better way to defeat a giant turtle monster? As with any other turtle, once he's on his back he can't get up again. But then Gamera starts spinning revealing that he was the UFO seen earlier in the film, throwing the characters for a loop as he takes to the air. Having a monster reveal a secret or a new ability is a great way of upping the stakes. Yes, General? Would you give me a cup of coffee, please? Black, no sugar. This is undoubtedly the worst version of the movie, but if you don't mind the American scenes constantly interrupting the film, it's got all of the key scenes. It even predates the Gamera theme we all know and love with its own Gamera theme. <laughs> The original Gamera, American Cut Aside, isn't a great movie. With the exception of Gamera's unique set of skills, it's a pretty standard monster movie that's a little confused tonally. It's not one of the best Gamera movies either, but it's a good time in its own right. The special effects scenes look great, I love Gamera as a monster, and it's easily the most fun I've had with this box set so far. If you're gonna watch this one, go with the original Japanese cut. Gamera! Sayonara! Sayonara, Gamera is what I would be saying if the next movie wasn't another Gamera flick. Gamera vs. Giren is the fifth entry in the Gamera series, and the tonal whiplash between this and the first movie can't be understated. Let's go, Gamera! By this point, the series had found its groove as kid-oriented. Gamera's days of coldly slaughtering thousands of innocent people were behind him. He was saving the world from a new monster in every film, and giving kids a ride on his back. One interesting thing regarding Gamera vs. Giren is that it is the first Gamera movie Shinsuke Kikuchi did music for. It's not a great score, but Kikuchi would go on to become an incredibly prolific and a very talented composer. If you've watched the original Japanese version of Dragon Ball Z, you've likely heard his work. He would go on to do music for the rest of the Showa Gamera series, and you can really hear the Dragon Ball in his score for Gamera Super Monster. I don't know, I just thought it was interesting. I'm putting off talking about this movie because I know the moment I'm done with it, it's back to the coal mines of schlock cinema. In the US, Gamera vs. Giren was released directly to television as Attack of the Monsters. None of these renamed Gamera movies have very specific titles, by the way. Gamera vs. Barugan was retitled War of the Monsters. Gamera vs. Gauss was Return of the Giant Monsters, and Gamera vs. Virus was released around the same time as Destroy All Monsters, so it was renamed to Destroy All Planets. Gamera vs. Jiger was changed to Gamera vs. Monster X, no relation to the actual Monster X that would appear in Godzilla Final Wars, and okay, fine, I'll talk about Gamera vs. Giren. Gee, grown up spoil a dream. Mm. Two boys, named Akio and Tom, are stargazing one night and see a flying saucer. When they go to investigate the next day, they get on board the UFO and are taken to a strange planet where they meet two friendly yet ridiculous looking space ladies. Gamera met the two boys on their voyage, so he chases after the UFO to rescue them from the two aliens who are actually evil and want to eat their brains. We'll gobble their brains raw. 
Eat their brains. Oh yeah, and one more thing. Very easy to forget. The two aliens have a giant monster of their own. A knife-shaped kaiju named Giren. Giren's design is a stroke of mad genius. The big dumb knife on his head can deflect laser beams, and even opens up to reveal ninja stars that he throws to incapacitate Gamera. A go -go dancer. Gamera's doing a dance. It can even do this. I love Giren, he's crazy. I'm actually okay with this movie. It carries a childlike sense of creativity and is full of imagination, from the design of the alien planet to the absurd appearance of Giren himself. It's undoubtedly silly, and the fight scenes really needed an editor because holy shit are they slow. The scene where the boys try to outrun the alien ladies also drags on for quite some time. I really started to feel the runtime with that. But I like Kieran as a monster, the creativity and silly moments go a long way in endearing the movie to me. Structurally, it's repetitive and it's a bit meandering, but I don't know, I liked it. I couldn't figure out where else to put this, but Akio is also just an extremely rude little kid. Let's catch it! Come on, you idiot! Is anyone here? Idiot? You kiss your mother with that mouth? Please don't make me go back to the salt mines. I, I, I want more camera movies. Ugh, fine. I won't spend much time on these next two films because I already covered them in my monkey movie video. Check that out after this video. But I'll go over them quickly. Bride of the Gorilla stars Raymond Burr as a man cursed into becoming a gorilla. It's hokey and vaguely racist, and it's just not very good. White people shouldn't live too long in the jungle. Kong Island is a deceptively marketed Italian movie. The slipcase on the Mill Creek set incorrectly summarizes the film to make it sound like it's more related to King Kong than it really is. No such giant ape appears. In actuality, it's an aggressively boring flick about mad scientists who try to control the brains of a gorilla population through mind control. It's a contender for one of the worst movies ever made. The sacred monkeys! The sacred monkeys! Where? There in the treetop! With that said, on to the next film. The irony of covering a Christmas movie during a Halloween special is not lost on me, but hey, it's in this box set and it has actual science fiction elements, so I gotta cover it. You, you Whoa! That's a lot to unpack. You'd expect something satirical from a title as raw as Santa Claus Conquers the Martians, but unfortunately what we have here is a rancid little children's film about Santa being kidnapped by Martians and forced to bring Christmas cheer to Mars. A couple of kids tag along for the adventure too. Santa's a fucking cognito hazard. <laughs> <laughs> he slipped laughing gas into the air, you're all gonna die. A Martian named Goldar isn't a fan of this whole Santa Claus plan and tries to get rid of him and the kids. Instead of Santa, they accidentally kidnap this massive doofus named Droppo, somehow mistaking him for Santa. Where are you going? Ho, ho, ho! And the film ends with the kids humiliating Goldar into submission with toys in a frankly unhinged scene. The discordant music, the bizarre camera work, the cutting, it all feels like a surreal horror film. <laughs> Apparently this film holds the distinction of being the cinematic debut of Mrs. Claus. Pretty demented first appearance. Hello there. <laughs> it's also on IMDb's bottom 100 movies, so make of that what you will. No one expects what the Martian Inquisition. <laughs> That's what that scene reads as. I like the funky little cheap sets. Hell, a lot of things in this movie are unapologetically silly. Obviously it's a film made for children, but every actor is delivering their lines with sincerity. Torg, come out of the spaceship. Torg, come out of the spaceship. Both that and the bizarre direction lead to unintended comedy. Right. Kiss me! I thought they actually were for a second. I was like, I didn't know this was a progressive Along movie. The when the movie is actually trying to be funny with the Droppo character, it's pretty miserable. Uh, 
This film is made up of peaks and valleys. It has select moments that are funny, but a grand majority of it is chintzy boredom. I do like how the movie is so retro that the robot the Martians use unironically looks like the robot from that one movie Spongebob was watching. If you can't come in here, no one's alone! What do you mean I shouldn't watch this? There's even a guy in a crappy polar bear suit that appears for one scene and is never brought back. We really needed a fight scene between it and the robot. Has someone been mistreating you? Oh, no, well, you sir. did steal you us from our home. This movie is utterly confounding. At times enjoyably goofy and other times tedious and trite. It does not fill me with the Christmas spirit. Get a group together to watch this one. Don't attempt to solo it. Took a while. Oh, they want us to do a karaoke! It's not happening. It's not... No. No, it's not fucking happening. Cha-cha-cha. Every... <laughs> <laughs> Teenagers from Outer Space is a 1959 B-movie with the title so ridiculous it could only really be used earnestly for a film of this era. The film was apparently written, directed, edited, and produced by one person, and he even has a small role. So, you know, it's a real auteur film. When we return to our planet, the High Court may well sentence you to torture! Apparently at one point he also called himself Jesus Christ the Second? Like, w w what the hell did I just stumble into? From where have you learned such things? Extraterrestrial teenagers come down in a tiny UFO to use Earth as a breeding ground for their giant lobsters named Gargans. Yes, really. <laughs> They're not a race of teenagers, but these are younger members of a humanoid alien species. One teenager named Derek, yes, this is an alien named Derek, cares about humanity and falls in love with a human girl. You are not familiar with the focusing disintegrator ray? The what? This movie is awfully optimistic about 1950s America. Everyone is so unrealistically nice to this weird guy they just met. From what I know about the 50s, anyone who shows up in town with weird clothing would get labeled as a communist or something. The teenagers have death rays that disintegrate the flesh of any living thing they hit. It's pretty silly, but conceptually gruesome, I guess. I can't remember if it's been featured in a movie I've talked about yet, but this may be the first movie on the channel that uses the infamous Bronson Cave, a filming location for many, many, many B-movies. In this movie, it's used as the breeding ground for the Gargans. The special effects on this thing speaks for itself. You're not from this world, are you? Lady, we're an hour and two minutes into this movie. How have you not parsed this information sooner? But it had life. And that life you had to take to satisfy your endless hunger for killing. Silence! The dialogue, whether it's coming from the robotic aliens or the humans, is deliciously absurd and delivered with complete confidence. You will take me to a man of surgery to remove the metal pellets from my flesh. Hmm. Attacked by monst- wait. What's that about a Hollywood visitor marrying 14 people? I have not been drinking! It does feel its hour and 25 minute length at points, but I thought the movie was pretty fun. It's consistently entertaining and endearing because it remains sincere. No matter how silly the dialogue and situation is, the acting and direction are genuinely trying to sell them. You are the son of our leader. No! Teenagers from Outer Space is a delightfully cheesy time. It's not good by any stretch of the imagination, but I'm surprised by how much I enjoyed this one. It was definitely made by someone who claimed to be Jesus Christ the Second. Also, I'm learning about this through a tweet, but apparently this entire movie is an unlockable extra in Destroy All Humans. That's pretty funny. So these next two movies, Crash of the Moons and Menace from Outer Space, are actually compilations of episodes from the 1954 TV show Rocky Jones Space Ranger. I had never heard of this series before. 
These movies aren't the most compelling pitches to get me to watch the show, but, like, they're not unwatchable. Crash of the Moons concerns Rocky Jones' efforts to evacuate a space colony before a moon crashes into it. And Menace from Outer Space is about a bunch of aliens trying to destroy the Earth. Yeah, these movies aren't very good. They really bored me. You can tell they're more deliberately paced television episodes stitched together into a feature. They drop you into the middle of the story with no context for who Rocky Jones is or what he does or what year it is or why I should give a shit. It's almost comical how many times they show the spaceship taking off and landing in Crash of the Moons. I guess it's better acted than some movies intended for actual movie theater distribution. There really isn't much to the series outside of some decent special effects for the time and fine acting. I can see why it was largely forgotten. It wasn't one of television's more enduring franchises. It's no Star Trek. <laughs> Menace from Outer Space is the worst of the two, so Crash of the Moons is the one you'd want to go with if you ever have a gun to your head and you're forced to pick between one or the other. Not very good. You know, I'd be relieved if I knew what was happening. Yep. Now the next four movies all relate to Hercules, the bastard son of Zeus, which is really testing the definition of a sci-fi classic. But I'll talk about them anyways, they're here. These movies are all unrelated outside of being Italian productions that have something to do with Hercules. Outside of Hercules Against the Moon Men because it was turned into a Hercules movie through the dub, but I'll get there when I get there. You see, he has no respect. What are these? <laughs> the first movie of the Hercathon is Hercules Unchained, a sequel to the 1958 film Hercules. No idea why it isn't on this box set too, but it's not really required viewing. Hey buddy, I think you got the wrong door. The leather club's two blocks down. Fuck you. Maybe you and I should settle it right here on the rainy field. In the middle of a mission to settle the quarrel between the sons of Oedipus, I shudder to think of who the wife of Oedipus is, Hercules accidentally drinks some amnesia water. No, seriously, that's what the ominous booming voice says. These are the waters of forgetfulness. He is then held captive by Queen Omphale, who apparently does this to everyone who drinks the water. She also kills the previous husband to make room for the new one. Pearls must have contact with the flesh before they take their best sheep. I suppose the unchained in the title is in reference to Hercules forgetting he's married. <gasps> While Hercules is fucking around with her, one of Oedipus's sons threatens to put Hercules' real wife to death. He eventually regains his memories and escapes the queen, racing to save his real wife from certain doom. Come on into the water! No, I'm not afraid! It's only that the doctors haven't discovered a cure for rheumatism! <laughs> <laughs> We're gonna kill you. The middle portion where Hercules is messing around with the queen is pretty boring, but the sets are massive and lavish throughout. The cast of extras is in the hundreds. There's a lot to appreciate with the production design here. The cinematography in places, even in this cut-off pan-and-scan form, is pretty good. I like how this scene starts with the leaves brushing up against the lens. It's a great way of introducing the setting. There are plenty of great trucking shots throughout. The cinematography and effects design was directed by Mario Bava, who would go on to have a prolific career in Italian horror films, including Bay of Blood, considered one of the most influential proto-slasher films. But all of that is just window dressing, you know, just stuff that's visually there. What is it like to actually watch this movie? Well, I did say earlier that the middle portion was pretty boring, and I don't find the entire film all that compelling either. It has bursts of action and excitement, but the moment-to-moment -moment storytelling is so slow, and the film's runtime is so long. The climax is where the film works the best. At that point, there's an action scene a minute, and it has the goofy spectacle of Hercules wrestling with a tiger plushie, in addition to a big battle at the end. It's definitely not bad, but outside of its production design, I didn't much care for it. I've got three more of these, so I'm unfortunately going to be here for a while. Hercules and the Captive Women doesn't have much to do with women being captured. Kill me, I beg you. Do not fear. It was originally titled Hercules and the Conquest of Atlantis, but I guess the distributors over at Wilner Brothers wanted to sex it up. The youngsters today think only about girls. Hercules is accompanied by his sons and a little person to settle a disagreement between two kingdoms or something. It's less that he wants to do this and more like his son drugged him and brought him on an adventure he has no interest in. 
After a storm separates him from the rest of the crew, he saves a woman from an evil shapeshifter, and she takes him to her home, the mythical Atlantis. You must die. Oh. Oh. I don't want to die. I guess having massive, impressive sets just comes naturally with an Italian Hercules production like the last movie. This movie was apparently shot in 70mm, so it sticks that the version of it on the Mill Creek set is a cropped pan and scan. Kinda ironic how the Mystery Science Theater version has better image clarity too. Ah! I can't help but empathize with Hercules here. I wanted to sleep through this one too. Hey, wait a minute. Yeah, this American cut of the movie rescored it and added stock music, which included the Gilman cue from Creature from the Black Lagoon. Check out my Gilman trilogy video when you have the chance. Anyways, Hercules and the Captive Women isn't bad by any means. It just didn't really grab me. It has great production design, but I really couldn't jive with the pacing. Maybe I would have enjoyed it more if I saw it in a theater with its proper aspect ratio. Also, come on, you can't just have a guy in a monster suit for one scene and then never again. There needs to be more of that. As is, it's dull. I don't really care for any of these Hercules movies, so let's just get them over with. I shall see to it that nobody sits upon your throne during your absence. Hercules' Tyrants of Babylon doesn't do much to improve my opinion of these things. Man, these Mill Creek Hercules flicks are doing a great job at making me realize I don't much care for sword and sandal movies. All the Herc films so far are technically impressive, but rather dull. I accept. I'm impressed by the spectacle, but the scenes connecting them are uninvolving and dry. It's hard to convey, but it's just something that doesn't interest me. It must be a combination of elements. The cropped aspect ratio reducing the scope, the muffled audio and visuals. It's weird, because I like Greek mythology. Maybe the movies are just bad. Or maybe it's because they appropriated the visual aesthetics of Greek mythology and applied them to a boring fucking sword and sandal movie. <laughs> Anyways, Hercules once again does battle with a large empire as he attempts to free slaves from Babylon, his primary motivation being that his wife is among them. Hercules has a pretty great entrance in this one. He swings around a big club, which is certainly different for the character. The past two Hercules actors have fit the role quite well, but there's something about this Hercules that doesn't quite work. He's got a baby face. I really don't have much else to say about this one. There's another impressive battle at the end, I guess. I guess that's a hallmark of this genre at this point. Also, evil queens. I tried to get into it, but I really couldn't. Next. Now this next Hercules movie is a little different. It's not actually a Hercules movie. It was originally a film starring an Italian original character named Maciste. The name was changed by American distributors, and as a result we have Hercules against the Moon Men. While it may lack Hercules, Hercules Against the Moon Men lives up to its name in another way, by actually having science fiction elements. Some science fiction elements. An evil queen, try not to get confused, there have been more than a few so far, sides with a species of aliens who have an army of rock monsters at their disposal, and it's up to Hercules, or Maciste, to stop them. He's basically Hercules, I can see why they changed the name, it doesn't make much of a difference. Alright, what else happens? Hercules fights a weird monkey man. <laughs> This scene and this Monkey Man character are never referred to again. There's a lot of clunky exposition. Hercules takes a long time to escape this trap. There's a lot of wandering around. And after that, there's wandering around in a sandstorm. And after that, there's even more wandering around in a sandstorm. And after that, there's a lot of wandering around in a sandstorm. Deep. 
Deep Hurting. This movie is infamous for starting the Deep Hurting running gag in Mystery Science Theater. Deep Hurting is in reference to the sandstorm scene that goes on for an unbearable amount of time. The film wasn't exactly moving at a brisk pace before, but it just comes to a dead stop here. The sequence is utterly incomprehensible at times due to this rancid transfer too. It's easily the worst scene out of any one of these four Hercules movies. Speaking of, this movie, although not intended to be one, is also the worst of these Hercules movies. The blend of science fiction and fantasy is a great idea, but Hercules just doesn't interact with the sci-fi stuff until the end of the film. The pacing is absolutely unbearable. Hercules against the Moon Men is a chore. Getting through these Hercules movies has been a Herculean effort. A haha, badum tish, haha. Nah, but seriously, I'm in fucking agony here. Hopefully, the next sci fi movie will be better. Right? I take it back. I don't want to go back to sci fi. Mesa of Lost Women is an endurance test masquerading as a motion picture. The challenge? How long can you stand this soundtrack? It never stops. It's genuinely maddening. I think I came out of this movie a worse person because of this goddamn soundtrack. Have you ever been by a girl like this? What? Have you ever been by a girl like this? This is the first line of the movie, and I'm already confused. Ay caramba! You can hear what it's supposed to be in the film's trailer. Have you ever been kissed by a woman like this? So, the plot. A mad scientist named Dr. Aranya has successfully created a race of female spider hybrids who have access to telepathy. <laughs> The men who get experimented on are turned into dwarfs. His prized creation is a woman named Tarantella, who can regenerate bullet wounds. Anyways, another scientist threatens to destroy Aranya's work and gets injected with stupid juice. And after regaining his memories, he shoots Tarantella and somehow gets an entire group of people to take a plane, only for it to oh so coincidentally crash near the mad scientist's lair. They then proceed to get harassed by the spider people for the rest of the runtime. It's a clunky, meandering story, and of course, that fucking guitar is playing the entire time. Dr. Aranya! Aranya, that's Spanish for spider. Yes. Yes it is. Thank you. The acting and dialogue across the board is otherwise wooden or terrible. This guy is supposed to be crazy, so you'd think his bad acting would be indicative of that. I want to fly. You... You want to... I've always wanted to fly. But he has terrible delivery even before he goes crazy, so I think he's just a bad actor. Oh, we've arrived. Normally I'd complain about a print of a movie being so crap that it has an awkward jump cut. That was a foolish thing to do. This was no imagination. But at 59 minutes into the movie, I'm just happy it gets the movie over slightly sooner. The closest this film gets to being enjoyably schlock is when the shitty immobile spider prop is on screen, which is sadly quite rare. There's this smug-ass narrator who talks trash about humanity. Strain, the monstrous assurance of this race of puny bipeds with overblown egos. Like, bro, you're human too, and you're in Mesa of Lost Women. Shit your pants, you pretentious asshole. Yes, you're right, Dan. Common sense tells you there isn't anything to his story. I want to smash the guitar over the head of the guy who thought this soundtrack was a good idea. Soon their nerves will break. I think this movie was made to hurt people. Nervous systems of insects. <laughs> the next movie is Galaxy Invader. A film from Don Dohler. Mr. Dohler spent the first half of his cinematic career making iterations of the same premise. An alien comes to Earth and rednecks wearing plaid shoot at it. And as soon as I saw this movie at a young age, the man was instantly iconic. What the hell? Hey! Hey! 
After a pre-title sequence that bears a striking similarity to the opening of John Carpenter's The Thing, a green alien crashes on Earth and is accosted by some of the most disgusting rednecks in film. <laughs> There's this horribly mean father character who's always wearing a boob window shirt, and he takes the alien's orb with the intention to sell it. What is this thing? Where did you get it? Dad, where's Carol? Shut up, I'm busy. He's helped by a slimy guy who's smoking and drinking beer in almost every one of his scenes. Now what we need are some guys with guns to go out with us tonight out around Joe's house to hunt something out in the woods. Eventually, a professor and his student come along to save the alien, and they have to contest with the crazy dad who, at this point, is mad with power. This is the fourth time he scared you with a gun. The fourth time? My god, what's that? Okay, so three things that stand out in this movie. Bad acting. Hey, no crap, Frank. What's the deal? plaid shirts, and people walking through the woods. More so than necessary, it's comical how many times they keep wandering through the same location. I don't know where else to put this, but the special effects were done by the Cracker Factory, a company I cannot find on Google. <laughs> It's an amateur production all around, with bad camera work and editing. It's not consistently entertaining, the endless scenes where they just wander through the woods are terrible, but there is an undeniable charm to how shitty it is. Everyone in this bar scene is given a line. What you got in mind, Custer? And it seems like the entire Dolor family was involved in some way. It just makes this look like a project made for fun. Despite being a film made four movies into Dolor's career, it feels like his first movie. What are they gonna look for, Ma? Hey, how about a game of Scrabble? I hate that game. Galaxy Invader is something to put on with a group. At its best, it's absolutely delightful. <laughs> Lost Jungle is a 1934 jungle adventure movie. Assignment Outer Space is... Okay, fine, I'll talk about Lost Jungle for a little bit. It stars Clyde Beatty, a real-life animal tamer who plays himself. There is an argument to be made about animal rights, and the character he plays could be called a Gary Stew. I do all my training without beating the animals up. But there's no denying the man was incredibly talented. The dude was so confident in his abilities that he filmed himself fighting a lion on film. But yeah, this movie really doesn't belong here, so I won't spend much longer on it. Vito. Assignment Outer Space is a dub of a crummy Italian movie named Spaceman. Hi there, Spaceman. Eh, eh, he said it! I am so sorry for using a Family Guy clip. It will not happen again. The film follows a group of cosmonauts as they try to stop an out-of-control satellite, which apparently radiates enough energy to obliterate the Earth. They're joined by a whiny reporter named Peterson, who they repeatedly call a parasite and leech to the mission. Well, they're not wrong. In the first 30 minutes, he gets the government to force a mission to Mars against the crew's wishes, which results in casualties. I'm getting lighter! I can make it! In a rather confusing pivot, this Mars mission is called off because of the out-of-control satellite. It comes out of nowhere, it's just not related to what happens in the first 30 minutes. The movie has a handful of odd diversions like this, like when the dangerous mission to stop the satellite and save the entire planet is interrupted by a rescue op. It feels like the movie is coming up with new scenarios on the spot, but it doesn't distract from the fact that 99.9% .9 of the runtime is spent inside cramped rooms. There's one character named Al who, aside from some mild misogyny, ah, so you have a weakness for the weaker thing. And she doesn't even call him sir, just George. is the most likable character. Everyone else is either really boring or flat. Peterson is a weak protagonist too. He eventually redeems himself at the end by stopping the satellite, but I hesitate to say I think he's a good character. He endangered the crew with the whole Mars mission, which ultimately had nothing to do with the central conflict of the film. At the end of the day, 
It's a boring space movie with a largely unremarkable cast and flimsy storyline that had a hard time justifying its very existence. It's easily skippable. Next movie. It's Christmas, Lucy. The past couple movies have been utter chores to watch. They're stinky relics of an era where you could just make the most substanceless thing and release it in theaters. Oh wait, they still do that. I say this to put the whiplash I felt with the next movie, Laser Mission, into perspective. The latest movie of this box set, releasing in 1989 or 1990, is a James Bond-esque action vehicle for the late and great Brandon Lee, son of Bruce Lee. After a failed rendezvous effort that results in him having to break out of prison, freelance secret agent Michael Gold has to track down and rescue a scientist who is being forced to create laser weapons for Cuba. He is accompanied by the scientist's alleged daughter, who can hold her own in an action scene too. The best element this film has going for it is Brandon Lee. The dude has genuine charisma. But who's the rightful owner? You're looking at him. He really sells the James Bond type character that was written for him. The supporting cast? Not so great. Haha, <laughs> they're going to cut off your head, manana. There are these two bumbling comedy relief characters, and they thankfully disappear for a good chunk of the movie. They unfortunately come back for the final act, though. This movie is always moving. Not five minutes go by without some wild stunt happening. <laughs> Bad audio mixing. <laughs> An undoubtedly awful but enjoyably cheesy main theme that plays throughout. This awful cut. In a corny script. Like all of your trophies, another monument to bloodshed. In addition to a weak supporting cast, Plague what could have been an underrated late 80s action movie. It's definitely not as good as its contemporaries. But despite everything holding it back, I was entertained throughout. Dare I say this film might be too good for this box set, and the action can be entertaining for how bad it can be sometimes. And you know what the worst part is? It's not even a science fiction movie. Not a single laser in the entire movie. Austin Powers, the parody of Bond, has more science fiction elements than this actual Bond riff. Are those sharks with laser beams attached to their heads? Brandon Lee can definitely lead an action movie. If his career wasn't cut so tragically short, he could have been a good action star. In any other context, this would be a pretty bad movie. But in the context of this box set, it's the fucking oasis. Laser Mission is good fun. I just dropped in to say, bon appetit. Next up is Killers from Space. The film stars a younger Peter Graves, best known for his appearance on the Mission Impossible TV show. Me, I know him from Airplane. You ever seen a grown man naked? In this film, he plays a scientist. The first three minutes are front-loaded with stock footage before revealing that Peter Graves is flying a plane, codenamed... Control from Tar Baby 2. Go ahead, Tar Baby 2. Uh... Control from Tar Baby 7. Roger, Tar Baby 7. <laughs> oh my god. They really named an entire squadron after a racial slur? You never fail to surprise me, 1950s America. Anyways, Dr. Martin, a scientist, returns after mysteriously disappearing in a plane crash that killed his co-pilot. He has an incision in his chest that indicates someone performed surgery on him, too. He also has no memory of what happened after the crash. Sure enough, after being given a truth serum that restores his memory, it's revealed that he was kidnapped by aliens. And the aliens look like this. Who are you? A scientist, like yourself. Who greenlit this? Who thought bug-eyed aliens that looked like they just saw Big Booba would be a scary design? Well, I'm not complaining. It's hilarious. 
Your thoughts have been recorded. Peter Graves keeps hallucinating these giant eyes, too. They're even in the marketing. They were really confident in this being a memorable and scary design element. Those horrible eyes. It's certainly memorable. I'll give them that. I have special eyes. No, I hear it. Hear it. They just reversed his dialogue. Let's play it back. 30, 31, up, 32. Ah, I see. Anyways, these aliens revived Dr. Martin to spy on nuclear tests so that they can further mutate their army of creatures. I'm actually not sure if that's the case or if they just want to make their own nuclear weapons. It takes a while to show the aliens, which is fine. That's what you do. You have to build up a mystery about what could have happened to the main character. But with a title like Killers from Space, the film deals its hand too early, so you're expecting aliens. And they look like this, so it's not a very scary reveal. And if the aliens can revive people and travel at light speed with their UFOs, why do they need to know how to make nukes? Splitting the atom should be nothing to them. They're breeding mutated animals with atomic energy already. Speaking of, there's this extended sequence where Dr. Martin gawks at stock footage of animals, and it gets me thinking. Was anyone actually scared of this sort of thing at the time? He's clearly not there. Better rear projection special effects had been done before. I feel like this wasn't impressive even for the time. It's horrible. You ever seen a grown man naked? Also, spoilers for... <laughs> killers from space, but the alien's base is so volatile that turning off the main power grid it's siphoning electricity from for just 8 seconds is enough to make their entire base explode. It's so incredibly preposterous and lame. I love it. While on the topic of positives, I do like the main alien. He's got a creepy delivery and cadence, despite his appearance. Our eyes developed to this state to combat the ever-growing darkness. So yeah, Killers from Space isn't always entertaining. It drags in places, notably that animal stock footage scene. But I kind of enjoyed it. It's completely sincere, playing these alien designs straight. It's charming schlock cinema. I want to stay optimistic, but I know it isn't going to get much better than this. Anyways, Phantom from Space. Like the last From Space movie, because it's from the same director, it's front-loaded with stock footage showing the military preparing for an encounter with an unidentified flying object. Yeah, this movie has no budget. The pilot of the UFO is eventually revealed, after a couple dozen minutes of non-distinct guys in suits and ties deliberating, to be an alien in a dinky spacesuit. To further complicate finding it, and presumably to keep the production costs low, the alien is invisible. The characters dub this thing an X-Man. Insert X-Men joke here. Ugh, that's so lame, I'm sorry. So it's determined that the X-Man needs his suit to breathe, and sooner or later he needs to get it back. He has to get his breathing apparatus back, or die. I don't understand. What's there to not understand? These characters throw all caution into the wind about the alien suit being radioactive. They can't stop feeling up the damn thing. And the characters in script really are the worst part of this movie. Nobody is interesting enough to follow, and all they ever do is speak in exposition. It makes the film a tedious slog where all anyone ever does is stand in rooms talking. They then drive to another location to do some more talking. They even talk about things the alien has done without ever showing them. It's so lazy. The locked down cinematography during the supposedly exciting action scenes ensures that no fun will ever actually be had here. I guess it's a little neat for a low budget production like this to attempt Invisible Man styled effects, though more often than not it's clearly just something being moved around on strings. I guess I like the cheesy theremin music too. But yeah, this is a real snooze fest of a movie. The characters suck, the pacing is glacial with the endless dialogue scenes, and the alien is underwhelming. Next movie.
Oh, hey, it's another film from W. Lee Wilder, the director of the last two movies. So with that in mind, the snow creature has the potential to either be funny bad or... Monotonous and tedious. A scientist and his photographer friend kickstart an expedition into the Himalayas, only for their team to get attacked by a yeti. He looks a little bit like a guy in a cap. Apparently this movie thinks Sherpas speak Japanese. Oh, what are you doing? Hi. I know they did this because they thought nobody in the 50s would notice, but they definitely weren't concerned about film longevity because now it's really funny in hindsight. So they do some hiking. And then they do some hiking. And then they do some hi You know what? I'm starting to think at least half the runtime is spent hiking. So they finally capture the Yeti, and the rest of the film's runtime is spent bringing the creature to Los Angeles. Now, what usually happens when you bring a monster back to civilization? I don't even need to say what happens next. There's some mildly amusing dialogue about whether the Yeti needs immigration papers because of the wording of a newspaper headline referring to him as a snowman and not as a monster, but that's the only part of this movie that I thought was even remotely clever in regards to its take on a creature feature. The first half of this movie is utterly monotonous and tedious, and I was convinced the rest of it was going to be just as dull. It does pick up a bit when the Yeti is brought to Los Angeles, but it doesn't save the movie from being a murky, unpleasant experience where half the action is obscured in shadow. The characters suck, the pacing is horrendous, the snow creature is a waste of time. White Pongo is… <sighs> a jungle movie. Oh, but wait, this one has a guy in a gorilla suit. It's also got the typically outdated views of tribes in Africa. You know, these jungle movies, which were made to whisk the viewer away on a magical journey to another place, really just make me want to look outside at the world around me. The rolling hills of North Dakota and Montana. The vast wilderness of Wyoming. The mountains of Glacier National Park. The clouds cascading over the summit. Ah, yeah. Beautiful stuff. Hang on. I'm getting distracted. What does White Pongo have to offer? Yeah. Nah. It's not science fiction and I'm not interested. Veto. No, no, no! Are you kidding me? Another fucking Italian Hercules movie? Well, this one has some history behind it. Sons of Hercules is actually the name of a TV show that re-edited various Italian sword and sandal movies to make their heroes related to Hercules, which explains this boppin' opening. The dude really gets around because there are 13 episodes of this show. That's a lot of kids. You know, this whole situation of taking an unrelated movie and slapping the Hercules name on it reminds me of how Germany would do the same with Godzilla movies by saying they're about Frankenstein. False advertising still sells, I guess. Alright, so for the sake of my own sanity and to keep this video strictly science fiction based, I'm gonna have to skip these next two movies. Fret not, they are both crummy. But the closest Sons of Hercules gets to being science fiction is that it has a guy in a crappy monster costume in the first 14 minutes. Giants of Rome is the next movie, and it straight up has no science fiction elements. There is an alleged doomsday weapon that the blurb on the Mill Creek synopsis alludes to, but it's actually a trebuchet or catapult. I apologize for the inconsistency, but if I want this video to be done on time, I have to cut some corners. I don't want to spend too much time on these sword and sandal movies during my Halloween special. To make up for it, I will cover another movie in the place of Giants of Rome. The Treeline version had other sci-fi movies that were removed for the Mill Creek version, and you know what, it might not be accurate to the contents of the box set that I'm holding in my hand right now, but I might as well cover one to make up for not covering Giants of Rome. The film in question? Robot Monster. I think you're just a big 
bully, picking on people smaller than you are. Now I will kill you. Robot Monster needs no introduction. It's at its good cinema. <laughs> the film follows a family in a post-apocalyptic landscape, devastated by a race of aliens consisting of gorillas wearing diving helmets. I don't even need to say why that's funny. The aliens, known as Roman, wiped out 99.9% .9 of humanity with a death ray. The remaining six people have survived thanks to a serum developed by a scientist, which makes them immune to it. It's preposterous. What? What, what do you mean, immunizer to the death ray? The death ray isn't a disease, it's a laser. A grand majority of this movie consists of these characters walking back and forth between the same two locations, one of which, of course, is Bronson Cave. Yeah, this is one of the many B-movies that used it as a location, too. Like, can you just imagine being some person on a hillside seeing that thing and just being like, what the fuck are those people doing? The robot monster develops feelings for the woman of the group, which angers his superior. It's kind of laughable. It took until there were only a handful of humans left in his conquest of Earth to go. Hmm, I kind of like this one. She's cute. String? Oh, it does go hard. <laughs> what the fuck? Robot string. Thinking about He's it. like, oh, I don't know how to do it. Okay, whatever. <laughs> Roman is really bad at his job, too. He doesn't take advantage of the superior technology his race created like any of the giant dinosaurs or giant armadillos with horns glued onto them. I come to make an announcement. Shadow the Hedgehog's a bitch-ass motherfucker. Pretty fucked up, too. They took footage from a movie where people just threw reptiles at each other. Higher thing is a little boy's dream. Why was that a dream or was it? With that in mind, the crazy bullshit like the gorillas and diver helmets and animal cruelty makes sense. It's all the sick machinations of a kid from the 50s. He can get us in the ravine if he promises easy death. But you don't know that until the end of the movie, and the film still expects you to take it seriously. And that's why the film is so funny. There isn't a shred of irony here. Robot Monster is as genuine a bad movie as they come, and that's why it's so much fun. No. 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 No, I don't want to. You said it with the exact tone and cadence of no. Hey, G, would you make me a sandwich? No. There is a lot of wandering around between the same two locations, and that can get really boring. Please tell me you're scared. Come on, the fourth. Oh. Oh, thank God. First Spaceship on Venus is another pan-and-scanned space adventure film in the same vein as Assignment Outer Space, this time being a German-Polish production originally titled The Silent Star. We are now a satellite of this silent planet. So a group of multiracial astronauts travel to Venus to perhaps find something cool, I don't know. And that's something worth noting right off the bat. With a lot of American space movies, it was typically just white people. So a movie featuring a cast this diverse is pretty wild for the time. But yeah, this movie is just... watchable. They could still be trying to send an SOS to another station. The Venus sets are pretty cool. I like the funky little aliens. But I really don't have much else to say about this one. It's too heavy on the exposition. I was mostly bored. Yeah, unfortunately, another movie I don't have much to say about. Splendid. Anyways, Breaking Bad is a 2008 TV show that aired on AMC and lasted for five seasons. The writing is consistently fantastic and the characters are so well realized. The direction in most, if not all, episodes is stellar. The tension in some episodes really got me hooked. It's a wonderful, dare I say one of the greatest, shows of all time. And it's something I would really, really prefer to be watching right now. Doesn't like that. Mr. Witty, I require 20,000 kilometers of cookie. Our next film was directed by Wisconsin schlock mastermind Bill Rubain. Best known for his 1975 summer blockbuster about a killer animal. The giant spider invasion. Yeah. 
I kid, but it was a considerable success at the box office, enough so that I'm sure it helped fund Rebane's other projects, including this one, The Alpha Incident. I'm just getting damn sick and tired of sitting around here doing nothing. A mysterious alien goo has landed on Earth and is immediately analyzed by scientists. They send the goop on a train to Denver, where it's accidentally released by a perpetually drunk man, and it infects a small group. Turns out this was actually a very, very big mistake, as it's revealed that the alien goop eventually kills the infectant in a spectacularly gory way. Now we have to stay awake. Stay awake? For what? This is a very sleepy movie. The acting and dialogue throughout aren't the most refined. Bastards! The camera work is locked down and uninteresting, with the exception of some sudden but appropriate snap zooms. Bad we don't have a couple more chicks around here. They'd see you two guys just sitting around twiddling your thumbs. These characters aren't very likable. There is a promising moment when the drunk man escapes, and it seems like it's about to pick up. But nah, it's just more of the same slowness. We don't even get to see his death scene. The film largely takes place in one or two locations after the first act, and ideally, the acting and script would help make the film tense and engaging. Unfortunately, the Alpha Incident is now 10 Cloverfield Lane. I'm not really a gore hound, but it's the only noteworthy thing about the film, and there isn't even that much of it. Like, holy shit, it's not even that believable, but it's so disgusting. They only have it for a couple scenes, but they really did a good job with this guy's death scene. Among the Bill Rebane flicks I've seen, this is probably his most competent, though that really isn't saying much. Oh, but who knew it would be this bad? It's mostly boring, unpleasant people arguing in one or two rooms, and the shoddy execution and limited budget keep it from being truly entertaining. It's got a really lame ending, too. They rip off Night of the Living Dead, if you know how that one ends. It has one impressive gore scene, just one, but, you know, that's something. And hey, at least it's not the giant spider invasion. I was 11 years old! Well, you're, uh, not any 11 now. <laughs> yeah, it's nowhere near as bad as that, but it's still pretty bad. Well, excuse me, I... I have to go to the John. Snow Beast is a 1977 CBS movie of the week about a killer yeti. On the eve of a big event, people are catching a severe case of murder by the hands slash teeth of a monster. The organizer insists on continuing the event anyways, and more bodies pile up as a result. It's up to a policeman, and at least two other people, to put an end to the monster's reign of terror. You're gonna need a bigger bitch. Yeah, this movie is pretty blatantly a riff on the recent release of Jaws, this time with a Bigfoot instead of a great white shark. It even cribs the monster POV shots. There are a handful of differences. The policeman is not the protagonist in this movie four people go out to kill the monster instead of three, and the key difference is that Jaws is a masterclass in building tension, with strong characters and an even more memorable score. Snow Beast, in comparison, is a clunky cliché that runs at half the length, and padded with skiing footage. A late 70s movie about a killer Bigfoot has the potential to be quite funny, unintentionally so. But unfortunately for me, this film takes itself dead seriously. I'd hate to have our guests or anybody at Carnival hear that kind of story. The camera work is similarly unremarkable, which is understandable with this being a TV production. You know how Jaws stopped using the POVs during its climax and instead started showing the shark in full? Well, Snow Beast is so cheap that it continues to use the POVs. Even during the Bigfoot's death scene, it's so lame. They took the less is more approach way too seriously here. Snow Beast is a boring, uninspired clone that isn't able to replicate the thrills of gums on a TV budget. At least it's only an hour and 14 minutes. It's not asking for much of your time, but I still think it's better spent elsewhere. If there is one takeaway from this box set, if you don't have a budget, you should make your monster invisible. 
The Astral Factor is about an infamous criminal who manages to gain astral powers, and he can use telekinesis and, most importantly for the budget, turn invisible, allowing him to escape prison and strangle more people. Of course, a detective is on the case. They're identical, Lieutenant. Not really. No, I don't see it. This is a plotting narrative. It wastes most of the unintended comedy on the opening five minutes. The rest of it is quite boring. The Invisible Strangler character has dashes of Norman Bates' influence with his strained relationship with his mother. Then get ready to be ruined, mother, because I'm busting this thing wide open! But there's nothing interesting done with it. The murder scenes also lack the arresting presentation they needed to be scary. As is, it's clearly just the ladies badly pretending to get hit and strangled. It's cheesy as hell. The pacing is really bad. Many scenes consist of the detective character trying to figure out where the hell the strangler is and I'm already falling asleep writing this sentence. There's kind of a cool idea for a scene where a lady is murdered during a musical performance. So this flick isn't a complete black hole of entertainment. I never want to hurt you, Mama. This is a thoroughly unexciting wannabe giallo film with an unthreatening killer, a boring protagonist, and I'm, I mean, just look at it. It's an ugly looking film, and I doubt it being in HD would help with that. Next movie. You want me to prove it to you, something? Directed by the guy who brought us the Americanized cut of the first Godzilla movie, Unknown World is a 1951 B-movie about a scientific expedition to find a place to live beneath the Earth's surface, in the chance that a nuclear war makes the surface uninhabitable. Nuclear annihilation was a very real threat at the time. It still is, if we're being real. And this movie is one of the many to tackle anti-nuclear themes. But it's unfortunately more than a little dry in execution. It's reminiscent of Journey to the Center of the Earth, but a problem it shares with the incredible petrified world is that it lacks the fantastical elements needed in this kind of story. The expedition team doesn't find anything crazy, like dinosaurs or robots or aliens. It's mostly white people in murky, poorly lit locations, and the biggest threat to them is underground earthquakes. It looks like they filmed in actual caves, and the miniatures and matte paintings look good in some shots. So that's some mildly decent production value for a film of this budget. Oh, and of course Bronson Cave appears in this too. Hey, this is getting rough! Yeah, I wasn't really grabbed by this one. The characters and their interpersonal drama that made up half the runtime aren't very compelling, and it didn't make the most of its premise. It sure existed for an hour. I will give it that. We have no plans. We have no hope. Blood Tide is a British monster movie from 1982, making it one of the more recent movies on this box set. It stars James Earl Jones as a- wait a minute, James Earl Jones?! What?! Well that's a surprise. <laughs> so James Earl Jones plays an archaeologist who gets drunk one night and frees a sea monster. With the monster free, it starts killing people. There's this couple here who get lost in all of this plot too, and they came to the island to look for the husband's sister, who was offered as a sacrifice to the monster and has gone insane. It's heavily implied, if not outright said, that she was... Yeah. Which was certainly a choice by the filmmakers. I think we're supposed to connect with the couple the most, but my first thought during their introduction was, Wow, these two are dead. If I was a very rich man. They aren't in much of the movie and almost feel superfluous. James Earl Jones' character gets the most to do. Blood Tide is pretty slow, which isn't necessarily a bad thing in regards to building tension, but it requires really getting to know these characters and liking them enough to not want to see them get hurt. With the exception of James Earl Jones because it's hard to hate the guy, and he's pretty good in this too, but I didn't really like anyone here. Dirty old man! I thought you gratefully liked little boys! The body count is sorely lacking too. 
so it's not even a good monster-themed slasher movie. There are some things I like about this movie. The scenes that take place in the monster's lair are oozing with atmosphere and are effectively spooky. They chose a pretty cool place in Greece to shoot the movie, too. The reveal that the monster does demonetizable things is pretty fucked up, but it is an effectively disturbing revelation. What little we see of the monster is cool too, I guess, but they really needed to show more of it at the end. After John Carpenter's The Thing, the bar for creature effects and design was raised quite a bit, and these cheapo B-movies where you don't really see much of the monster even towards the end don't quite cut it anymore especially in a film where the slower pacing doesn't build tension the way the filmmakers intended. It's not a terrible movie, but it doesn't offer much to the creature feature subgenre. As is, it's just a curiosity for being a kinda fucked up but mediocre monster movie that happens to have the voice of Darth Vader in it. A mostly mediocre film with a couple standout sequences. It got a nice Blu-ray release from Arrow, so this movie does have a fan base. The Brain Machine, however, is a film I doubt many people can see value in. So here's the plot. Four individuals volunteer to participate in an experiment involving mind reading, which eventually happens and mildly crazy psychological shit happens. That's what you've been telling us, huh, Lieutenant? We're all killing machines! There's some espionage going on here, too. There's an extended sequence where a guy tries to run away with the plans for the brain machine, and the sequence ends 15 minutes in. It's just there to waste time. And, brother, this film is a masterclass in wasting the viewer's time. This is the kind of movie that dedicates a 20-second shot to someone getting out of a plane, getting into their car, then starting their engine. The movie is full of dumb shoe leather shit like that. This experiment is gonna get an X rating. It lacks intrigue. You know when you're out in public and you overhear someone's conversation? This entire movie has that vibe. It's just listening to some conversation that doesn't concern me and I'd rather go somewhere else. I had more interest in finding all the shots with the boom mic in it, and I tried to follow this movie too, but it's just incomprehensible. There's seriously not much else to talk about here. It's a clumsy, poorly edited and paced sci-fi flick. It's so forgettable that it doesn't even have a Wikipedia page, and so poorly documented that it's unclear whether it was released in 1972 or 1977. Honestly, it needs to be studied in a lab or something. It could be the cure for insomnia. Easily one of the worst movies of this box set. The Wild Women of Wongo is certainly a title for a movie. Now, because it's neither science fiction nor horror, I have the grounds to not cover this. But because it struck me as particularly awful. Although my father was the king of Wongo, I am his daughter. I feel compelled to talk about it. The film is about two tribes, the tribe of Wongo, which has beautiful women and ugly men, and the tribe of Guna, which has ugly women and beautiful men. They are very unusual women, oh my father. Allegedly. The visual quality is so bad that it's not immediately clear who's supposed to be ugly and who's supposed to be pretty. The ape men, who are the film's antagonists, especially look no different from either. It's a pretty bad sign when the allegedly beautiful men don't look that great. Imagine the casting process here. Yeah, we're casting you as a member of a tribe of ugly women. Filming starts tomorrow at 5am. The maidens of Wongo are ready for marriage. I come to ask you and the god to receive them. We will ask the great dragon. Not a single person here gives a performance that isn't wooden. Wahoo! So a conventionally attractive man appears in Wongo to warn the tribe about a bunch of ape men who are going to attack, and the women get all worked up about him. When the men try to kill him and the women intervene, they're sent off as sacrifices for a rubber crocodile prop. I mean, their god. But yeah, this is a flimsy setup for an extended sequence where the women are forced to dance to appease the crocodile god, and this is probably what the film was made for, in addition to a cat fight. Bring it up. Bring it up. Bring it up. I feel like I just lost brain cells thinking about this plot. 
There's also this stupid parrot who keeps interjecting. He sucks. But yeah, shocking. Wild Women of Wongo is a pretty awful movie. Killer. 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 The acting across the board is terrible. The movie is intended to be comedic, but it never really attempts a joke beyond, haha, everyone speaks stupid. It's awful and embarrassing on every conceivable level, but that's what drew me to it and why I didn't skip it. <coughs> what, you want me to say something about prehistoric women? Alright, well, um... Prehistoric Women is another skippable movie. There is a nine-foot-tall caveman monster who terrorizes the women, but it's hardly a science fiction element. So Prehistoric Women is a jungle adventure movie about a tribe of women looking to capture cavemen to be slaves and husbands. Angor and his tribesmen are amazed to see that they've been attacked by members of the weaker sex. There's next to no dialogue, and that would be a cool idea for a caveman movie. Movies without a word of spoken dialogue have been done before and since. By being on this box set, though, I don't think I even need to say it's not executed well here. Angor's mother, who knows of the women tribe, points out no, the right no. direction to Angor. The entire thing is narrated by a guy who explains everything like we're dumb babies. Angor gathers some stones to use for the head of his club. He starts hacking two of them together to make a sharp edge. But I really couldn't imagine the movie without him, because the direction is so unclear and the visual quality is so poor, it's hard to make out some scenes. I'd love to hear the narrator explain what the hell happened here. Yeah, this movie is just fetish fuel, if we're being real. And you know, there's nothing wrong with having a kink. I'm not a prude, but you know, much better options exist now. You don't have to go to a theater to see this kind of thing anymore. Not to mention, this thing was made during a time of 50s conservatism. It's squeaky clean. And this movie is also really bad. She angrily informs Arva that she has decided that Angor is to be her husband. Arva! I need But Arva violently disagrees. A lot of the runtime is dedicated to this catty squabbling between the ladies of the tribe over the men. The men sit idly while Ruig, who seems to have a fetish. For the most part, this is a pretty boring flick. There was a point while I was watching when I got up, walked away, and started doing laundry. That's how bad it got. But towards the end of the movie, there's a part that caught my attention. Suddenly, out of nowhere, a fucking dragon shows up. It is Korax, the flying dragon, the scourge of the skies. So they say. It's just a bird. And I went right back to doing the laundry. There is something approaching excitement towards the end when the giant caveman starts terrorizing the tribe. Whatever happened to the women's resourcefulness? They were throwing rocks earlier and they managed to capture a couple guys. Suddenly they're rushing to the men's arms expecting them to do something about it. It seems that women were women in those days too. With poor acting, bad direction, and an annoying narration, prehistoric women is barely worth glancing at. Moving on. Oopsie, I accidentally covered those, and they took longer than a minute. Haha, <laughs> oh no, oh well. Now for They Came From Beyond Space, I decided to switch things up a bit and watch it on my 4K TV. It didn't help. <laughs> what we have here is a British movie directed by Freddie Francis who I'm more familiar with as a cinematographer on films like Martin Scorsese's Cape Fear remake. Francis was directing Hammer Horror films at the time, too. And if there is one thing I can give this movie, it's that Francis had a vision for it. Meteors containing aliens from the moon make landfall in Britain, and when a team of scientists go to investigate, their bodies are taken over. One scientist is immune to the possession attempts, as a recent surgery gave him a metal plate in his head. His girlfriend, who has one of the largest beehive hairdos I've ever seen, was possessed too. So he has every incentive to try to figure out what's going on, and eventually put a stop to the aliens' plans. Which includes unleashing a plague, and possessing even more people. This movie does have a visual style going for it, and the blocking of actors and general camera work are well done. The sets are pretty impressive too, even if they are holdovers from those cursed Peter Cushing Doctor Who movies. 
Unfortunately, They Came From Beyond Space isn't really a standout in alien invasion movies. The middle portion of the movie where the main scientist is trying to break into the alien's base is awfully repetitive and slow, and it does pick up a bit towards the end when he hitches a ride to the moon, but by then the film has descended into total cheese. And I like cheese, but the film lacks excitement. It's a humorless script that still has a pretty silly presentation. Even the music feels like it's from a zanier movie. The actors are doing the best with their material, even Michael Goff, who appears at the end, but this film is just awfully generic. It feels like it came too late. Much better films like it had come out a decade prior, and had better special effects. That is to say, they had special effects. This movie is so low budget it can't even afford those outside of a couple miniature shots. Even Invasion of the Body Snatchers was wrestling with overt, disturbing themes about conformity. This movie doesn't have anything interesting like that. It plays the premise as straight and boring as possible, and it ends somewhat abruptly too. Everyone tried their best, but the material, the script... What master? The master of the moon. ...was lacking, and it didn't have the budget to make it stand out among its peers. Final verdict on They Came From Beyond Space? It stinks! <laughs> Oh hey, a non-gamera Daiei Tokusatsu. The must be Warning from Space is their first kaiju production, actually, releasing in 1956, making it one of the earliest kaiju films in color too, beating Rodan by 11 months. Also, fuck you, I'm watching the original Japanese cut. This is my list, I can do what I want. Deal with it. Anyways, the film is about a race of aliens, Pyrans as they're called, attempting to warn humanity about a rogue planet that's on its way to destroy the Earth. Their intentions are pure, but their presentation is sinister, so they send one of their own to disguise themselves as a human to be less creepy about it. Unfortunately, they chose a popular nightclub dancer, which complicates things a little. The plan is to launch all the nuclear weapons on Earth at the rogue planet, but it requires convincing the world that aliens exist and, of course, there is some skepticism. As the rogue planet approaches, the Earth experiences catastrophe in an awesome display of miniature effects. This is a very simple movie, themes of nuclear annihilation. An understandable commonality in Japanese kaiju films at the time are very palpable here. The scenes where Tokyo evacuates from the oncoming Planet R are eerie considering what happened 11 years prior, and the film does a great job at conveying the panic and dread. The film has a great presentation too, with inventive establishing shots that show the film's use of color. There is an emphasis on environment here, which does well in foreshadowing how it will ultimately crumble in the wake of the rogue planet. The characters are a tad dry here, which does drag the film down because there isn't a single interesting person to latch on to. They're not terribly interesting, but I do like the Pyrans. They've got a memorable design, and their willingness to help humanity is unique among aliens in tokusatsu media. Unless you count Ultraman, but you don't see any Ultras that look like this, now do you? Warning from Space is okay. It's well shot, the Pyrons are memorably bizarre creatures, and the apocalyptic final scenes are an awesome achievement in special effects. It's a little weak on the character side of things, but overall I would say I... liked this movie. Yeah, what the hell. I liked a movie on this box set? One that wasn't a Gamera movie? Holy shit, that's crazy. Genuinely a pretty okay movie. Wow, what do you know, we're right back to mediocrity. Planet Outlaws is an edited version of a series of serials called Buck Rogers. Uh, your name please, Buck Rogers? Uh, Lieutenant Rogers officially. The titular character is one that has persisted somewhat and even got a TV show in the 70s. Ultimately, this movie is not a great introduction to the character of Buck Rogers. <laughs> After being perfectly preserved for 500 years, Buck Rogers and his sidekick Buddy are enlisted in an effort to defeat a gang of space pirates. Planet Outlaws is a fucking mess. But to me it seems much hopeless. Am I right, Marshal Craig? 
there's a palpable sense that a great chunk of story is being stumbled through at all times. And that's because they took a nearly four hour long serial and condensed it into a mere hour and eight minutes. The editing is never not jarring. Music is constantly cutting off awkwardly because they evidently didn't have access to the original audio track. It's a mess. There is a charm to this material though. The special effects are novel and there's plenty of action throughout. No doubt because it's 12 30 minute episodes being Frankenstein together. But yeah, if you ever plan to watch the serial, I wouldn't recommend Planet Outlaws, unless you've got exactly an hour and eight minutes to live. In that case, it wouldn't hurt. Let's get them out of here. This gas is making me drowsy. The next movie is The Phantom Planet. Taking place in the distant future of 1980, an astronaut is trapped on an asteroid, which looks like a giant chicken nugget, and is inhabited by tiny people. When exposed to its atmosphere, he shrinks to their size and is held captive while his fellow astronauts try to find him. He also duels a guy for a mute lady's hand in marriage and were unfortunately subjected to his hairy chest. The dialogue here is ridiculous, it's so hokey. I grow more and more convinced that the wisest and best is to fix our attention on the good and on the beautiful. And he'll just take the time to look at it. And they spend a lot more time talking than they spend doing. Things pick up a little when it's revealed that the tiny people are under threat from another species of alien, ridiculous looking creatures named Solarites. They feel like last minute additions to make this boring movie more interesting. It's a random diversion that's apparently the film's climax. I can't help but compare this movie to a Twilight Zone episode with a similar premise. In The Little People, two astronauts discover a civilization of miniature people living on a desert planet. As one astronaut tries to fix the spaceship so they can go home, the other astronaut goes mad with power as he becomes the little people's god, threatening to kill them if they don't worship him. He doesn't want to go home because he won't be able to lord over anyone anymore. It's a great episode because it knows how to use its simple premise to its fullest in a half hour time slot. The crazy astronaut gives a hammy yet memorable performance, and it works as a little Aesop because of the ironic twist ending that puts him in his place. The best Twilight Zone episodes, in addition to having intelligent writing, feel like full experiences. When you stretch those premises to feature length, they're not as good, and that's the problem with so many of these sci-fi movies. They're simple stories that work best if adapted into little TV show episodes. They don't justify a feature length. This movie especially feels like it's spinning its wheels, with a simple meandering story and hokey dialogue. There's a funny monster I wasn't expecting to see in a couple scenes, but it's still not worth it. The Phantom Planet isn't very good. Next movie. Colossus and the Amazon Queen is an Italian sword and sandals adventure film. It is also a comedy. No, sometimes I have a pain in your purse. <laughs> All the time. Hey, fellas, sorry I'm late. Instead, let's pull another movie from the tree line release. Zontar, The Thing from Venus. That shot was creepy. It's like a painting of her, but without any eyes. Zontar is a remake of Roger Corman's It Conquered the World, a film which released 11 years prior. So yes, Hollywood was unnecessarily remaking shit way back then, too. Well, my philosophy with remakes is that if the first go at the premise wasn't the best it could have been, and has the potential to be improved upon, a remake is welcomed. I'm only using the first It movie as an example. Chapter 2 was fucking awful. So a remake of a crummy early Roger Corman movie has a strong chance of being better. Rather bafflingly, Zontar might just be worse than the original. My husband is in an iron lung. Stop. What shall I do? The film concerns a man in a long-distance relationship with, and being groomed by, an alien named Zontar. He helps Zontar enact an evil plan to mind-control the human population of a small town. 
and it's up to his friend, played by B-movie actor John Agar, to stop him. The action leaps off the screen as the characters sit around and talk for half the movie. You have time. Time for explanations. And when things actually happen, it somehow has zero energy. The climactic confrontation between former friends. One is standing up and the other is sitting down. Now they're both sitting down and the other's standing up! Oh. Zontar himself is a shitty paper mache creature, and he sends out these crappy little totem pole guys to bite people and turn them into mindless slaves. I can't decide if Zontar looks better or worse than the alien from the original movie. You don't see much of him, but when he is on screen, the film instantly picks up. Because outside of the occasional funny moment or line read, I saw a funny looking boy! Uh. This is a dire movie. This is awful. <laughs> this is so bad. Despite being a meager 70 minutes, the film is padded with scenes of characters walking or driving to their next destination. Even during the supposedly epic climax, it's just a bunch of army guys wandering through a cave. This shit is a chore. Not only is it inept on a pacing front, but the writing is just as horrendous. And you actually think that I condone this reign of terror? That I'll swear allegiance to this Zontar? When John Agar's wife is mind-controlled, his solution is to fucking murder her instead of, oh, I don't know, trying to kill Zontar first? He doesn't know the rules of the mind control. Maybe he was in an unhappy marriage and wanted an excuse. This isn't a writing problem exclusive to the remake either. The original was just as baffling. It more or less has the same exact script. No effort was made to update it. I seen a funny looking bird. I saw a funny looking boy. The ending is totally anticlimactic too. After what feels like endless wandering through a cave, there's a struggle with Zontar that lasts for five seconds before he gets poofed out of existence by the worst laser beam effect I've ever seen. What? That's it? Oh, this is... Are you fucking kidding me? But hey, at least this movie has a laser beam effect, unlike Laser Mission. Zontar the Thing from Venus has its ironic charms with the bad acting and special effects, but it's bogged down by tedious pacing and a cold, graceless script. Not even a curiosity, this one. Stay far away. Maybe watch the Roger Corman version. It's also not a good movie, but it's definitely better than this. Cosmos, War of the Planets, is a 1977 space adventure film. Hmm. A late 70s space adventure film. I wonder what could have influenced the filmmakers to create such a thing. Well, don't worry. This does not take major influence from that one. Miller? Huh? It's instead a retro throwback to a time when sci-fi adventure movies were aggressively dull. After faffing about for the first 20 minutes, the film eventually becomes about the crew of a spaceship searching for alien signals. The signals are Toccata and Fugue in D minor for some reason. Works for me. It's Halloween. Crank that shit up. There seems to be a theme of over-reliance on technology, which manifests literally by them being killed by it. <laughs> They encounter these cave goblins, and just the appearance of these things elevated the movie for me. They look like fucking Middle Earth orcs. What the hell are these guys doing in a sci-fi movie? Don't you hate it when you're having simulated space sex and this happens? Later on, there are zombies too. I don't know where else to put this, it's just weird. I know I'm just rattling off random notes, but there's also this part where random music with vocals kicks in and it just stops. Enter decompression chamber. The song never comes back. What happened here? Have you heard about David and Goliath? Who? There is an undeniable charm to the sillier elements here, like the friggin' Middle-Earth aliens and the random Bach music. 
or the sudden zombies at the end of the movie, but getting to those random moments is like swimming through the swamps of Dagobah. And no, not that kind. After a certain space adventure film in 1977, movies like this really had no place. If you enjoy guys in crappy suits wandering around in silence in a feature that feels like it's ten years late to the party, this flick is for you. Ega is not the noise you make when you're choking on food. It's actually the name of the penultimate film of this box set, and while it may not be the last, it certainly feels like the true final boss. Ega is a dopey little horror comedy. What did he say? He's real! Of course, he's real! <laughs> about a teenage caveman who falls in love with a girl. He eventually comes to civilization, and a monster movie happens. It's hard to talk about a movie this simple without just going over individual shortcomings and strange moments, so that's what I'll do. They're dead. Ew, dead people, how embarrassing. Ega is full of padding. Here's an example. Early on, we see Roxy, the girl that Ega is attracted to, come out of a store with a bathing suit. After a 30 second driving scene, she pulls up to meet her boyfriend Tom at a gas station. She then tells him she bought a swimsuit. I just bought myself a new swimming suit tonight. We didn't need to see that scene earlier. The film would have flowed better if we started the scene with her pulling up because the information we gained from the prior scene is restated here. Ega is full of useless padding like this. From the extended helicopter flight scene to Roxy and Tom fucking around in a dune buggy when they're supposed to be looking for her missing dad. Not to mention Tom's multiple little time-wasting songs. I was a Let's talk about Tom. I'm gonna dick you! Ega is the product of nepotism, a blatant star vehicle for the son of Archal Sr., who I must add is the producer, writer, director, and co-star. His son is named Archal Jr., who plays Tom. That? <laughs> He's the intended teenage heartthrob of the film, like Elvis Presley, or whatever equivalent there was. He's apparently pretty good in a movie called The Sadist, which is in another Mill Creek box set and I will eventually cover it. But he really isn't very good here, especially when he starts singing. I love you, <laughs> he has an obsession with his dune buggy, which is apparently so amazing that even the poster makes reference to it. It's too bad we didn't bring the Doom Buggy. Let's go after him. I'll take you up there. My Doom Buggy's all ready to go. This thing's supposed to be safer than my Doom Buggy? We'll get the Doom Buggy and we'll whiz right out there. <laughs> Ega's first appearance is in front of the car, and when Roxy sees him, she passes out. And almost immediately, she comes back to her senses. Not even a full minute passes. Later on, when she's trying to find her dad, all Ega does is tap her on the arm and she's out cold. It's ridiculous. Does she have narcolepsy or something? <coughs> Ega is played by Richard Keel, who played the Solarite from Phantom Planet and, more famously, appeared as the villainous henchman Jaws in two James Bond movies, The Spy Who Loved Me and Moonraker. How does that grab you? It's interesting to see him in an early role like this. Seeing him compared to the other actors really emphasizes how tall he was. He's wearing this fake beard and they shave it later. And I gotta put a spotlight on this. Question, is it a normal family bonding exercise to shave your dad's face? Well, Roxy does that and it gets weirder when Ega gets in on the action. He even starts licking the shaving cream. Why? It's so gross, I hate this scene. Dad, I think you better break this up before I scream! Tell him you're hungry. I'm not! Well, think of the alternative. Why? Would you say that to your daughter? Gross. <coughs> also, I can't write an EGA review without highlighting the worst moment of ADR in film. You left the road right here. 
Watch out for snakes. Ooh. Who said that? Watch out for snakes. Why is it there? Watch out for snakes. Watch out for snakes. Watch out for snakes. If there's something to come out of this, Arch Hall Sr. made a million dollars out of this movie and seems to take its strangeness in good spirit. It's an ultimately harmless flick. Outside of the one or two scenes where Ega gets handsy, that shit must have been really embarrassing to film. Give him something else. But it's so dopey, too. Every attempt at comedy is groan-worthy. And the only scary parts of this horror movie are whenever Arch Hall Jr. assaults the viewer with another song. Wowdy, wow, wow! It's a tepid little movie. I really can't imagine watching this outside of Mystery Science Theater 3000. Tequila. I mean, I did for this video, but I wouldn't willingly do it again. Watch out for snakes! Who ah! said that? Fun fact about this box set. Not a single movie here has a rating higher than 5 on IMDb. And brother, did I feel that. Outside of my guilty pleasure of the Gamera movies and the genuine decentness of a couple movies here, I think it's safe to say that a lot of these are complete garbage and not worth your time. I went into this video with optimism. The previous box set I reviewed had some good movies in it, but most of these films felt like the leftover scraps of what could have been on the horror box set. In fact, out of the 50 movies here, 13 movies aren't even pure science fiction. They were so strapped for science fiction movies that they resorted to fucking jungle adventure and mythology movies. Oh, yeah. Sorry about that. Oh hey, Gamera. I haven't seen you since part two. Where the hell have you been? Huh. Well, anyways, Gamera vs. Virus is the fourth entry in the Gamera series. In the US, it was released directly to television as Destroy All Planets, because god forbid we have an English Gamera title that makes sense. Also, fuck you, I'm watching the Japanese version. The film's opening is kinda badass. Gamera stops the first wave of an alien species by destroying their giant bumblebee butt ship. And their final words are... Damn, I love the timing of the title card and music. It's a moment that's missing in the American cut because they use this dumb Destroy All Planets title. We found a deadly creature protecting the Earth. Its name is... Virus isn't even trying to destroy the Earth. I mean, come on. <laughs> he just stole a part of the ship. He just it. stole the boom. It was the first to establish a definitive plot structure that would be used throughout the rest of Gamera's Showa era. Two kids befriend Gamera, and a new monster appears to fight him. Gamera is usually incapacitated in some way, too. But he eventually breaks free and fights the monster one more time. In the case of this film, the two kids are Boy Scouts, Masao and Jim, and the monster in question is the alien kaiju Virus, who descends from space with a crew of disguised henchmen. After being humiliated by the boys, the aliens fuse to make Virus giant-sized. This is all at the end of the movie, though. The rest of the film follows the two boys' adventure, as they're captured along with Gamera, who was mind-controlled into doing the evil alien's bidding. The aliens say their super catch ray only holds for 15 minutes, so it's pretty funny how the film spent 11 actual minutes dedicating that time to a stock footage montage. But hey, it gave me footage to work with when I was talking about the Gamera series as a whole in part two. So, you know, 
It works for me. He just stole a baby. That's cool, you should throw it. Yeah, now throw it now. Now, in an earlier video I did on Godzilla's Revenge, I talked about how that film's use of stock footage worked in context, because it was a young Godzilla fan's dream. But Gamera vs. Virus is in a different situation. When the virus aliens read Gamera's memories of previous films, that makes sense. The shot's probably even longer in the actual movie. <laughs> oh, buddy. Dude, come on. <laughs> you had no reason to hit that. It's blatant padding, but it would be acceptable if it were two minutes instead of the 11 that it is. But, you know, it makes sense. What doesn't make sense is when they use stock footage from the first movie to depict the current in-universe rampage the aliens send him on. And it's in black and white. Noticing a, a little... A little yeah, there's a bit here. of a problem here. Yeah, there's a bit of a problem here. Something's a little Doesn't different. quite look like the rest of the movie, I'm honest. <laughs> Something's a little different about this sequence. It's awfully familiar. The fucking, the fucking balls on them to do this. <laughs> Alright, so on to individual observations. I like how minimalist Virus's base is. It's bizarre and creative. I never noticed I that the sandwiches there. were hexagons. That's great. These kids were willing to sacrifice themselves for the entire Earth. Kinda raw, to be honest. I am loving that the entire JSDF is mobilized right now, and they're just like, well, our choice is surrender or let two boys die. We can't let two boys die. <laughs> Shin Godzilla makes fun of this. <laughs> it literally does. The reincorporation of the boys being pranksters and how it ultimately saves the day is the exact kind of absurd logic this series thrived on from here. I love it. Gamera, it's coming at you. Gamera, please give up. Gamera, we know it's coming at you! Virus is another weird monster in Gamera's lineup of foes. He doesn't have many wacky abilities, but his appearance is memorable and he's still involved in some utterly bizarre imagery. <laughs> okay, Gamera, what do you fucking do now? He's still in there! I can't believe King of the Monsters will, like, rip this off. Gamera gets absolutely fucked up in his fight with Virus, too. The dude gets impaled by Virus's head, and god damn is that gnarly. Oh my god! Oh. He's dead. Like, he has no stomach anymore. Oh, and before I forget, this was the film that gave us the Gamera March. <laughs> Overall, this is probably on the lower half of the quality spectrum of Gamera films. Jam. Oh, jam. Oh, jam. Oh, jam. It's not the worst, but it's not a very good movie either. I felt like I watched like a two and a half hour movie. <laughs> kinda, yeah. yeah, it's a bit it's a bit sluggish. I was shit. It was awesome. <laughs> Regardless of its shortcomings in pacing, it is pretty entertaining. Virus is a fun villain, and the absurd moments go a long way in endearing the film to me. Eh, it's dumb fun. Okay, so now we're done. As I was saying earlier, this box set really isn't worth it. That said, as I was researching these flicks, I came across a lot of comments on YouTube uploads of them from older people who have a fond nostalgia for them. So it is true that, no matter how bad a movie is, it will always have a place in someone's childhood. They were made by working people, and despite how much mud I fling at these flicks, I can't disrespect the hustle. Does that mean you should buy this box set? Hell no. You can find most of these movies legally for free online, and some of them are even in higher quality on streaming services like Tubi. I bought this set for $10.20 on Amazon, so if you want to have something to display, then knock yourself out, it's pretty cheap. Just know that you're inheriting a lot of mediocrity. Well, that'll do for this year. Halloween is just around the corner, so... If you'll excuse me, I've got a watch list of horror movies I need to start chipping away at. Stay safe, eat your veggies, and have a happy Halloween.